there are, obviously, multiple methods of time travel. The method we will discuss here is in the form of a thought experiment. Therefore, it renders an exercise in mental-only time travel methodology. However, theoretically, if one were to build a ship as a trans-temporal vessel, the same rules could be applied to navigating such a physical craft to transport their body, as described here, mentally only. Targeting of Time Tunnel This method involves attacking an, exactly as possible, estimated arrival time from a given, equally only relatively constrained, window of departure. If your jump time takes five seconds, your arrival time will also last five seconds. Thus, this ten seconds must be factored into the equation of duration equals distance to be traveled across time also. Imagine if you wanted to make a time jump from 2012 to 1905 and be able to return. You would need to establish a stable time tunnel, portal, or wormhole between these two dates in time. The wormhole, in this case, would be 107 years long. It would have to slice or cut through and around the events during this intersecting portion of time in a manner so as not to affect changes in them. It would also have to bend or warp over and around the targeted destination locations exact position as it changed position over the intervening time. The most obvious course to avoid interference and reconnect only at the most distant location, the targeted destination location, would be an arc. An arc can be defined as like an arched bow. It has an ascending node a central antipode point, and then a descending node. In the ascending node, the arc shape of the wormhole is traveling both away from the jump point as well as backwards in time. In the descending node, the arc shape of the wormhole is traveling toward the target point as well as backwards in time. Because in the ascending node, time moves somewhat more slowly than the time in the descending node of the parabolic arc, one also must factor this into their time travel equations. At the central antipode, or midpoint, between the jump point and the ascending node of the time arc on the one side, and the descending node toward the target point on the other, will occur an event, already known in the later date, that will largely determine the nature of the time jump one will be making between point A in the future and point B in the past, or vice versa. This central event occurs due to the time tunnel's warping of the quanta underlying space-time. For example, all forms of wormholes already exist, in potential. When they become activated and while being used, they exist. The rest of the time, they do not exist. Not in any standard way we would experience them. However, while we are going through a wormhole, or time tunnel, we are going from point A to point B at a nearly instantaneous speed, although point A may have happened a long time later than point B 
and not even at the same exact location in space either. This is all related to the natural facts about quantum teleportation, that it occurs in the absence of the operant observer principle, such that whenever photons cease striking electrons, the electrons return to a condition of quantum uncertainty, where they seem to inhabit multiple locations simultaneously in an orbital cloud around an atom's nucleus. When any particle smaller or faster than a photon strikes an electron cloud, it does not disturb its state of uncertainty or alter its condition of probability. We call superluminal energy a spectrum of antimatter particulates and include antiparticle counterparts from many actual sizes of stable matter energy quanta. However, superluminal matter we call the energy field of the nulliverse, where all is pure tachyonic light, so called Serenkov radiation in the modern scientific vocabulary. Inside the diameter of the time tunnel, we physically become particles traveling faster than light speed in order to pass from one point in space-time to another at a speed faster than we could even traveling at the speed of light. Therefore, at the midpoint of the time arc, when the time traveler begins to return from their journey outside of time and turns back toward the mainstream sequence of events, this corresponds to an event in that mainstream sequence of events that occurs at the midpoint date and time stamp between points A, the jump point, and B, the target destination. This event serves as an omen that can help predetermine the natural course comprising the series of events the time jump will consist of. For example, say I want to leave on midnight between December 20th and 21st Eastern Standard Time from Tallahassee, Florida and travel back 107 years to 1905 and visit Nikola Tesla in his Wardenclyffe Laboratory in Shoreham, Long Island. First, I would measure the distance from here to there. Then I would superimpose an equal length symbolizing the duration, 107 years approximately, to travel. Following this, I would compute this measurement as upon an arc, or as alike the pattern of a solar prominence, that forms in the magnetic field of the Sun. I would ascertain the midpoint in terms of a date and time, and I would ascertain the midpoint in terms of a location of distance, both between A and B. I would have to compare the overall events of the world in the midpoint date to the events in the world occurring at the midpoint location to be able to ascertain an omen about the nature of the particular time jump involved, and obviously this would differ based on each different jump. Because the omen can be known before the time jump is undertaken, it has an influence on the natural course of events in the time jump to the same extent that the time jump will change the natural events that occurred in the past. In this case, I would be looking for an event that would occur somewhere around the eastern coast of the USA, perhaps in South Carolina, in the sixth month of the year 1958. This is because the time tunnel is 107 years long, and one half of 107 is 53.5, or 53 years and around six months one-half or 0 0.5 of a year. One cannot determine if the omen is positive or negative about the impact of the time jump on those undertaking it, at least not until after one has taken the jump and followed the natural course of events of doing so. Only after one returns to their own altered future events time 
will one know if the changes one made while in the past are positive or negative? I can see a future where nanotechnology on the subatomic level has given us all almost unlimited physical and mental powers. People have extremely heightened sensory awarenesses and are able to run extremely fast, leap off cliffs, jump off buildings, bridges, airplanes, etc., and survive, just get up and walk away. People are instantly aware of all new information as it becomes available from anywhere on Earth. Mankind has replaced our once and future idea of gods, and we stand in this future on the brink of using these miniature robots to turn back time and travel only as minds at first, but ultimately with our bodies as well, back in time to a moment prior to our leaving. In this future, there will be no net as we know it now, no more wires connecting point A upline to point B downline. The internet as a series of tubes will burst until its information contents fill to capacity the equilibrium state of their natural environment. In this case, that being, like water in an aquarium, Earth's electromagnetic field itself. This field will become the Internet, and people will not access it using primitive gadgetry like they do today. Nanites, subatomic machines running quantum computing programming languages involving trinary rather than binary, in which a third maybe state is produced using quantum level uncertainty probabilities, will inhabit all of us, as well as all the Earth's gravity well, and they will instantaneously sink a link from anyone anywhere to anyone anywhere else. The result of this will be identical in all respects to controlled telepathy, or, more exactly, a two-way form of nonverbal communication between distant brains using electromagnetic impulses of encoded data alone. In this future, such telepathic communication will occur via the networked nanobots virtually instantaneously to anywhere on the globe, and all knowledge will be instantly accessible via mind alone on the global electromagnetic telecommunications network. Likewise, these nanites will have the ability to replicate using the elements in their surrounding environment, meaning they will be able to clone and replicate tissue cells at an adjustable rate and thus provide the useful ability of being able to heal any injuries. Better living through nanite technology will provide the appearance of immortality, but at the cost of humanity's soul. All our innermost thoughts will become publicly available on a telepathic internet that has no concept of personal privacy or individual boundaries. No one will have any secrets anymore, but we will all be physically indestructible. Eventually, we will each have our own automatically provided channel on a cyborg-integrated telepathic telecommunications form of the modern internet each providing non-stop, constantly streaming footage of our everyday, mundane, daily lives. Some will begin staging their own reality shows, while others will atrophy from activity into a silent audience, watching the social players. Our shows will begin to compete with one another, and a massive global ratings system will be devised to to determine from one instant to the next whose channel is the most popular. This global ratings system for weighing all souls will be called the Enochian Communications System, or ECS for short, and eventually those operating it 
we'll begin to see the use for it in establishing a form of global government where the most popular channels are combined in one group setting to solve all the world's problems. This is what happened in ancient Atlantis. The group presented their findings to the world of their era in the form of Atlantean democracy, the way things should have been done all along, but never were. Then the flood swept over. Time cycles. These cycles have ebbs and flows. These cycles fluctuate over time. Time has tides. There is matter governed by entropy that may be imagined as forwardly mobile, our expanding cosmos, etc. And there is zero-point energy governed by unknown laws of physics, and this ether energy may be imagined as moving opposite the flow of entropy and thus causing negentropic loops, eddy currents, and cycles in time to occur. If the tides of time are that time flows forward and backwards simultaneously, so to speak, then not only does this imply there is an effect greater than time that causes and influences this effect to occur, as the moon causes Earth's tides, but it means that, by torsion between counter-rotating opposite polarities, we can harness the friction created between matter, bosons, and zero-point energy, tachyons and any other form of superluminal fermions. If we apply counter-rotation of electromagnetic fields, we can definitely generate a large amount of potentially kinetic energy. If we can spark this and harness that spark by harnessing the counter-rotation's friction, we have completed the model. Again, think in terms defined as laid out in T4. If space is three-dimensional, that is, the entirety of all matter energy that can be measured in any single given moment by width, breadth, and depth in three opposite right-angled directions, then time is one-dimensional. It is the dimension added to space when matter energy moves over time. Space would still be space if time stopped or ceased having ever existed. But if you remove time from space, you reduce time to one long noodle, the time stream, a one-dimensional point extended into a two-dimensional line, expanded into a three-dimensional plane, and this square cubed to yield the tesseract symbolic of fourth spatial dimensional time. Time is a Mobius strip if separated from the three dimensions of space. Time is a single ribbon, a supersymmetric fiber of supergravitational tachyons passing from one spiral galactic synapse to the next along the intergalactic filaments. The garden of forking paths seems to have many roads, but in truth, there is only one. If, in our future, we develop time travel into the distant past, we could open a wormhole from the future into the past and ship tools and supplies and workers through this wormhole into the past to construct massive underground facilities the so-called dumbs. We would then leave these in the past and allow them to be discovered only by the right people along the intervening way until, later, we would develop them into the modern dumbs where we would experiment with ways to create time travel. If dumbs form such a temporal tautology in the past, 
perhaps God is a similar such temporal tautology in the future. Life is that element that can walk between moments. It exists suspended eternally and just in jest upside down as well it seems between past and future. Imagine three puddles of paint. One is red and symbolic of the future. One is blue and symbolic of the past. One is yellow and between the other two and is symbolic of the present. Then time sweeps through. It smudges the yellow paint puddle into the blue paint puddle, but it also smudges the red paint puddle into the yellow paint puddle. The result is, of course, a meaningless mess, until you study which paint puddle has smudged by how much into which other paint puddle. After a moment of time, there will be one half as much red puddle, the yellow puddle will be orange and beginning to tint purple, and the blue puddle will be purple and four times its original size. So are the past, the present, and the future, like paint puddles. The past, the present, and the future are therefore not separate things in themselves. They act as though they are, and divisible they may be, but also indivisible and one. And in this regard, though they may be multiple, a plenum, they must be a unity and a solitude. If there were no such thing as a future, again, the present and past could still exist. If there were no future, nor any past, the present may yet exist. But if one exists, all may exist. And if all may exist, then one must exist. Again, the existence of the different facets or phases of time may or may not exist. But the existence of time itself, as a singular force, cannot be denied as existent. If there were no time, there would be no movement, no motion, no changes at all. Since we see around us movement, motion, and changes occur, we infer their cause to be the existence of time. Consider the various parts of time. 1. The past. 2. The present. 3. The future. But there are also two other parts. A. Entropy past to future flowing matter time b negentropy future to past flowing energy time there is also the singular unity of all these traits into the one concept of time itself therefore the tetractus begins to form one time a entropy B. Negentropy. 1. Past. 2. Present. 3. Future. So we see the six traits of time and how they may combine if past, present, and future are compared to salt, sulfur, and mercury, the alchemical stages of matter akin to ice, vapor, and fluid phases of substance with the four elements of Tetragrammaton to form the complete Tetractus of Pythagoras. Such is time not only a singular directional additional dimension tacked on to space's three dimensions in the form of animation, movement, motion, change, etc., but a combination of multiple traits, each on their own level or dimension of correspondences and therefore of multiple dimensions in itself. Time is the fourth dimension. As a force, this means time is a single directional additional dimension tacked onto space in the form of motion. 
as a geometry, however, this implies time has shapes and forms within its own set of physics and exists as an entire additional dimensional cosmos that overlaps our own invisibly, full of complex and geometrically impossible loops and cycling patterns. In this hyperspace dimension of four-dimensional space that is time itself, there are gravity shadows of three space shapes such as comets, planets, stars, black holes, etc. But there are also other shapes which I've called elsewhere metaforms that simply float about existing in this fourth dimensional hyperspace soup of zero point energy. These hypershapes or metaforms are like prismatic lens flares that form over time or rather along the directional axis of time's overall motion to the cosmos. As a result of zero point or superluminal energy emanating originally from the future and thus flowing opposite the entropic flow of time for matter as it decays into energy from past to future. This superluminal tachyonic light from the future casts a shadow into the past from the matter energy that exists as our present cosmos and this shadow not only accounts for the additional mass, the dark matter causing inflationary expansion of the cosmos unseen by telescopes, but takes the form, very specifically, of a tesseract over a torus.